We interrupt this program to bring you the latest on the three-day-old hostage situation in Grand Central Station. Field correspondent Mike Anderson on the scene. Mike, what's the latest? Well, Bill, there's rumor of good news. The mayor has just stepped up to the podium. He's about to trust the hundreds of reporters and spectators. And why don't we just listen in? Thank you. Thank you all. You should tell by the smile on my face that I have good news. I'm happy and I'm pleased to announce that just about ten minutes ago, all 14 captives were released unharmed to our hostage situation. And we just add that the perpetrator himself has promised to surrender in 22 minutes to our hostage negotiators. 22 minutes, Your Honor? Yes, we felt as though that was not an unreasonable request. We just wanted to listen to the last part of the Boxcar 7-Eleven old-time radio pod. <laughs> well, there you go. It's not unreasonable. So even if you're at work and they got a policy against it, you march right in there, take charge of that computer, type in your browser, boxcars711.podomatic.com or boxcars711.lipson.com. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N. And if your boss has a problem with that, you turn around and tell him, back off, scumbag, or you too may need a hostage negotiator. It's not unreasonable. Around the Internet, around the world. Broadcasting from Dallas and Philadelphia, this is another Humphrey Camardella production. So you think you're smart, eh? You're nobody's fool? <laughs> Brother, you can be taken. CBS presents Bunko Squad. The Bunko Artist, the Swindler, the Con Man. He comes in a thousand disguises. He has a million tricks. He can make a sucker out of you. Be on your guard. For the protection of you, the American public, we open once again tonight the files of Bunko Squad. Authentic cases drawn from the police records of the nation. You will be guided through a case of Bunko step by step, as it actually happened, as it could happen to you. Now, here is your host and guide, the noted authority on Bunko schemes, Captain Frank Crumble. Good evening. We call the confidence man a Bunko artist because, in his evil way, that's exactly what he is. The slickest cleverest, most dangerous artist in the underworld. Perhaps you haven't thought that bunco schemes can be dangerous. Well, then, listen. It's just me, Wilbur. I swear that Miss Blanchard is helpless as a baby sometimes. Wilbur! Wilbur, where are you? My land, you're never arrived. Wilbur! Wilbur! <laughs> What you just heard is part of an actual case taken from the police files of St. Louis involving one of the most dangerous and vicious bunco schemes ever to come to my attention. Here is the case of the bookworm. The unfortunate victim in the case of the bookworm is a man by the name of Wilbur King. Mr. King is a retired heating contractor who had managed to save up a sufficient nest egg to live modestly with his wife, Jane, in a comfortable home just off Del Mar Avenue. The Kings are honest, good, church-going folks. Actually, that's where the whole thing started. One Sunday morning in a church overlooking Forest Park. During the services, Mrs. King had noticed a strange couple staring at her and at her husband. And when the service concluded, she was surprised to find herself greeted most cordially by a woman she she didn't know and had never seen before. Why, no one imagined running into you here. Well, I'm sorry, but I'm afraid you have us mixed up with someone else. Well, oh, dear Charles, they're not the Pearsons at all. I was afraid you were mistaken, my dear. Oh, and after the way we stared at these poor people, too. Yes, please forgive us, folks. Well, isn't that true, mistake? <laughs> you see, we're new in St. Louis. We don't know a soul... I guess it was partly wishful thinking on my part. I am sorry. Not at all. I know how it is in a strange town. Now, come now, dear. These folks aren't interested. 
Oh, uh, uh, perhaps you could tell us where we might catch a bus to the Radcliffe Hotel on King's Highway. Why, that's right on our way home. We'll be glad to drop you off. Oh, I wouldn't think of putting you to all that trouble. Nonsense. No trouble at all. Well, it's, it's very kind of you. Oh, um, I'm Charles Hollister. This is my wife, Irene. Uh, how do you do? Uh, my name is King, and this is Mrs. King. I'm so glad to know you. Delighted to meet you. Yes, indeed. Most delighted. That meeting, accidental as it may have seemed, was part of a carefully laid plan. Try to put yourself in the king's place. They were friendly people, anxious to meet any new fellow churchgoers, so naturally they offered them a lift. But even if they hadn't, it wouldn't have mattered. The Hollisters would have pursued the accidental meeting in another manner. Once the contact was accomplished, Hollister made himself as charming as possible. By the time they'd reached the Radcliffe Hotel, he persuaded the kings to have Sunday dinner with him. And the next night, he invited them to be his guests at the Municipal Opera. And all the while, in casual, matter-of-fact conversation, Charles told Wilbur King about himself and his work, that he was a writer visiting St. Louis to do some scientific research at Washington University. And the Kings were most impressed with their newfound friends. But when the Hollisters were alone in their hotel room... A swell pitch this is going to be. That old bitty nearly yak my arm off. You know what she does for fun? She puts up preserves. Well, then, baby, you're going to put up preserves and like it. Because mm. there's a big pot of jam at the end of this rainbow. Fifteen grand worth. Fifty honest charm? Mm-hmm. Well, we only cased them for about eight. How'd you find out? <laughs> oh, charm, baby. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that old guy did everything but give me the key to a safety deposit box. Oh, darling, that's wonderful. I could kiss you for that. Uh, what's stopping you? Nothing. You lovely hunk of man. Mm. Say, maybe we can shove this pitch along a little faster, huh? Oh, I don't get impatient, Cookie. It never pays to rush a mark. Okay, honey. You got the brains. Now, get busy and finish copying that book I got from the library. Hi, right, you great big famous author, you. <laughs> <laughs> During the next two weeks, Hollister played Wilbur King like a trout. It was flattering to be wined and dined by a younger, brilliant man. And an author at that. And when the game was finally set to land, Charles was ready with the gaff. He set the scene by inviting the kings to a mysterious dinner celebration at the Chase Room. Oh. Happy days. Oh, Mrs. King, let me fill your glass. Oh, no, please. <laughs> That's a beautiful watch you have there, Hollister. I've been admiring it. A beautiful watch you have, Wilbur. Here. It's yours. Oh, no, no, no. I couldn't dream of it. Nonsense, Mr. King. You take it. Charles can afford it now. Hey, what is this mystery? I swear you've got me eaten up with curiosity. Yes, oh. What's happened? To, I haven't found a gold mine, have you? <laughs> oh, you're not far wrong. Here, read this wire. Yeah. The Board of Education excited about your manuscript. Wanted for high schools throughout the states. Hey, yeah, Hollis, do that. That's wonderful. Isn't it? Read the rest of it. Advance order confirmed at 40,000 copies. Wire me hotel senator immediately if you can deliver by October Joseph Sterling. Who's Sterling? Oh, he's my literary agent in Jefferson City. Oh, I'm so happy for both of you. 40,000 copies. Think of it, Jane. A toast. To the book, everybody. To the book. To the book. <laughs> Say, Wilbur. I've been wondering if I could ask you to do me a favor on this thing. Of course, Charles. Anything. What is it? Well, as I was saying to Irene last night, wasn't I, honey? Mm-hmm. This is a tremendous break, of course, but it also means I'll have to interrupt my present work to get this book printed. Irene came up with a wonderful idea. Why not ask you to help out? You have the time, the brains, the organizational ability. I'd sure. be glad to do anything I could, but isn't that the publisher's job? Oh, Wilbur, you don't think I'd go to a regular publisher? Except a piddling royalty with a firm order for 40,000 books in my pocket? <laughs> oh, no, no, in your life. I intend to publish this myself. I have a printer in Jefferson City all set to go. The way I figure, it'll cost around 30,000. I'll gross 150,000 on the order. A net profit of $120,000. That's a lot of money. Isn't it, though? And it'll mean a lot of work. Every student in the state will have to use a copy of my book. And that's only the beginning. There are 47 other states. <laughs> of course, Wilbur, I wouldn't expect you to take on the selling and distributing job for nothing. But it's out of my line. Oh, Wilbur, nonsense. Since when is a $60,000 profit out of anybody's line? $60,000? <laughs> Surely. Look, you come in with me and share the initial printing cost. And as soon as the books are ready, you take over complete supervision of sales and delivery from then on. 
and I'll cut you in for 50% of the profit, including the order I've already got. Wilbur, what an opportunity. Oh, no, no, it's an opportunity for me, Mrs. King. You see, I, I'm a writer and a scientist. I, I've got no head for business, and I'm not interested in it. It'd be a godsend to have a businessman like Wilbur to handle things. A partner I can trust. Now the enticing bait was out, and Hollister felt sure that Wilbur King would snap at it. Well, wouldn't you? The chance to make $60,000 on a $15,000 investment, and at absolutely no risk. What would you do? If you're like Mr. King, you'd probably ask for time to think it over. And you might not want to trust your own judgment completely. You might, as Mr. and Mrs. King did, seek advice from your lawyer. Black lead gas common... Monsanto stock, brown shoe. Wilbur, do you realize you're selling everything you own? Sure, John, we realize it, but it's only for a short time. Sixty days, Mr. Hollister said. I don't know. I don't like this. But it's such an opportunity, and the Hollisters are such nice people. You said yourself that Hollister was perfectly right to handle this himself instead of through a publisher? I know, I know. Well, he's, he's leaving for Jefferson City to pay the printer in a day or two. And I've got to put up half the money if I want to share in the profits. Well, it's just that I hate to see you take a chance with practically all the money you've got. What kind of chance? Why, Mr. Hollister is known and respected by every big scientist and educator you can name. You should see the letters he has from them. Stationery can be obtained and letters can be forged. Forged? Why, you suspicious old codger. Well, that's what lawyers are paid for, Wilbur. To be suspicious old codgers. But what about the telegram from Mr. Sterling saying that the Board of Education had agreed to take 40,000 copies of the book? Say, I've got that wire right here in my pocket. I forgot to return it to Charles. May I see it, please? Uh, sure. Hmm. Sterling, eh? Excuse me a moment. Miss Kennedy, put through a person-to-person -person call to Mr. Joseph Sterling at the Hotel Senator in Jefferson City. Uh, buzz me when you've got him. Thank you. Just an extra precaution, Wilbur. I'm sure your friend, Mr. Hollister, would appreciate that you're the type of man who makes a thorough investigation of a deal before he puts up his life savings. But Charles and Irene are such wonderful people, I'm sure why they wouldn't even suggest that Of they... course <laughs> they wouldn't. This is just plain foolishness, John. I've been a pretty fair judge of men in my time, and I tell I know, you... I know, Wilbur, but a man can always be wrong. We'll see. Hello? Mr. Sterling? Mr. Joseph Sterling? Mr. Sterling, this is Judge Rowan in St. Louis. I represent Mr. and Mrs. Wilbur King in connection with a partnership that they are forming with a Mr. Charles Hollister. Yes? Yes. I understand that you are Mr. Hollister's literary agent. I see. Oh, really? Well, about the order from the Board of Education. Yes? Yes, 40,000 copies of the book. I see. Mm-hmm. Yes, I see. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Sterling. Goodbye. Well, what did he say? He says it's the greatest book of its kind he's ever handled. He says the 40,000 order is only the beginning. He expects every school system in the country to take it. Oh. Well, what do you say now? I knew it. What an opportunity. The Hollisters are such wonderful people. Yes, the Hollisters were very wonderful people. And smart, too. Smart enough to have their accomplice, Mr. Sterling, waiting in Jefferson City just on the chance that the Kings might call him. Naturally, he confirmed the order. And so John Rowan, the lawyer, had to admit that the deal sounded okay. And Wilbur King sold out his securities his only bulwark against old age, and handed Charles Hollister a check for $15,000. The next day, the Hollisters left for Jefferson City to sign the contract with the printer, they said. The Bunko scheme had worked. across the street to Miss Blanchard's for a few minutes, dear. She's here. Why, what's the matter? Oh, nothing. Only we haven't heard a word from Charles and Irene for over two weeks. Yes, that is strange, isn't it? Well, I'll be back in ten minutes. I do hope nothing's wrong. They're such nice people. 
people. Yes. Such nice people. Operator, get me the hotel senator in Jefferson City. That's right, Charles Hollister. But I know he went there. Are you sure? Never registered? Thank you. Boatman's Bank? Chief Teller, please. He cashed the check the same day? Yes, I understand the check was in order. Of course you had to honor it. Operator, I want to put in another call to Jefferson City. The purchasing agents of the Board of Education. It's just me, Wilbur. I swear that Miss Blanchard is helpless as a baby sometimes. Wilbur, Wilbur, where are you? My land, you're never around. Wilbur! Wilbur! We'll return to Captain Trumbull and tonight's Bunko Squad story in just a moment. To politely paraphrase history, George Burns while Gracie fiddles, and the result is, of course, the laugh riot heard every Wednesday evening over many of these same CBS stations. George and Gracie are two of America's best purveyors of nonsense, and two neighbors everyone enjoys visiting. You can never tell what Gracie has up her sleeve, but you can always bet it'll get George into trouble. Be sure not to miss the Burns and Allen Show this Wednesday and every Wednesday at that spot on your dial marked CBS. Now, here's Captain Trumbull again to continue tonight's Bunko Squad story, The Bookworm. In a game as carefully constructed as a fine watch, Charles Hollister had, as the Bunko artist would say, roped his mark, told him the tale given him the convincer, and had taken off a nice touch of $15,000. As a result, Wilbur King was in emergency hospital at death's door and attempted suicide. The next day, Mrs. King went down to police headquarters and told her story. No. 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 Do you recognize any of the pictures, Mrs. King? No. I stared at these pictures until they were all beginning to look alike. Lieutenant Scott, I didn't want to come here. I should be at the hospital. Mr. King is in competent hands. You can help him best by helping us catch these suspects. I still can't believe that they were such nice people. They're always nice people, Mrs. King. Uh, when you've gone over all the pictures, will you come into Detective Levesque's office and make out a crime report, please? Yes, Lieutenant, I will. I'll wait for you there. No luck yet, Lee. She's still looking. She'll sign a complaint? Oh, yes. She's upset, but she'll come through. Here's all we've got to go on, Skipper. It's not much. Oh, this is a book? <laughs> Pathetic looking job, all right. Mm -hmm. Well, see what you can do with it. Will do. And uh, this watch. Mm. Beautiful. Well, what's the connection? Oh, King admired it, and Hollister took it off his wrist and handed it over. Oh. You know these con men when they're building up a mark? Lend me your knife, will you, Lee? Sure. Here. Oh. Serial number. Uh, jot this down. Five two three one four one eight. Gruelin. I'll run a make on it. Say, did you see the piece in the Globe this morning about King shooting himself? Yeah. And if Hollister sees it, he'll take off for the moon. Maybe he won't see it. Fat chance. Anybody as smart as that bird is watching the papers, all right. Lieutenant Scott had his con man figured correctly. After paying off their confederate, Joe Sterling, for his assist in answering the telephone in Jefferson City, Charles and Irene Hollister were taking it easy between jobs at the Hotel Southern in Memphis. Charlie! Mm -hmm. Charles! Oh, don't bother me. Can't you see I'm reading? Oh, that silly St. Louis paper. What's so interesting in St. Louis you have to read the paper every day? Just careful, sweetie. You never know when a sucker might get panicking under the coffers. Doesn't cost much to just... What the... What's the matter? They held a copper already? Oh, worse than that. That jerk king shot himself. Oh, no, let me see. Here. Wilbur King, 54. Calls given his despondency when a team of confidence workers 
built him out of his life savings. Well, that's stupid. Condition very critical. You know what that means? If he dies, that's technical murder. Chuck, they can't tie it to us, can they? We were careful. Shut up and let me think. Tried to cover everything. There's nothing in the book. He didn't write any checks. Oh, what do you take me for? No, I didn't do anything they can trick. Wait a minute. What is it? My wristwatch. I gave it to King, remember? It wasn't engraved, was it? It might as well have been. It's got a serial number, and I used my right name when I bought it. Oh, no. In Toledo, remember? I might have known, you stupid fool. You wood full of bonehead play like that. Now you've got it. Now, don't you crack up on me. That's all I need. But they'll trace that watch. It may take days. And if I have anything to say about it, I'll never trace it. Come on, now, start packing. We've got a long drive ahead of us. <laughs> Everything clear? Yeah, I think so. Oh, Chuck, I don't like this. And I love it, I suppose. I don't know, but... Look, you just keep this car running. I'll be out as soon as I can. I've got to get the sales record from that jewelry store before the cops trace that watch. Be careful, Chuck. Please. December. No. Chuck, quick, hurry. Uh. Mm. Oh, your numbskull, get this thing going. Come on, step on it. Yeah. Keep going, we can make it. Take the next corner, fast. We made it. Yeah, don't stop. Keep this thing moving. Yeah. Did you get the record? No, the alarm went off before I could find it. They'll never get it now. The cops will blanket this place in no time. Yeah, I know. Head for St. Louis. St. Louis? Why? I've got to get that watch back. Our only chance is that Mrs. King hasn't told the cops about it. Now, step on it. When things were going his way, Hollister was a smooth, affable con man. But now, in trouble, over his depth, cornered, the veneer came off to reveal him for what he was. A desperate, dangerous criminal, ready to stop at nothing. Meantime, in St. Louis, Bunko Squad was making headway. Detectives Scott and LeBeck were beginning to fit parts of the puzzle into place. Hello, Lee. What's new on the King case? Well, this for one thing. I got it at the public library. A book, huh? Science Progresses by James Whitmark. Published 1941. Mm-hmm. And guess what? I know. The manuscript Hollister showed Mr. King is an exact copy, word for word. Right. No wonder King thought it looked okay. Well, that locks up the intent to defraud angle. Yeah. Who oh, say, here's something else. I got a report from the manufacturer on the watch Hollister gave King. It was sold by Levine and Wise in Toledo. Levine and Wise? Yeah. Why, why? What's up? I just saw a teletype. Levine and Wise were knocked over last night. Uh Uh-oh. That isn't all. Nothing was taken. What? But all the sales records were disturbed. This is a break, Lee. Hollister must have broken into the jewelry store trying to get the sales slip on that watch. That means he bought it in his own name. Yeah. And suppose he didn't get the sales slip. Well, we can check that. If he didn't, he might come back and try to get the watch. On the chance that Mrs. King forgot to tell us about it. Lee, get that watch out of property, will you? Sure, sure. What have you got in mind? I think it might be a good idea to give it back to Mrs. King. I'm scared, Chuck. Oh, stop it. You're getting me jittery, too. Seven years without a hitch, and then this has to happen. I suppose something goes wrong. For Pete's sake, lay off. Look, we cased the house for two days, haven't we? Yeah. Not a cop in sight. She goes to the hospital. She comes home. It's all clear, I tell you. I'd feel better if you'd ditch that gun. I said I wouldn't use it, didn't I? Okay. 
Okay. Here we go. Chuck, remember, no gun. Oh, brace up, Cookie. We won't need a gun. We can con her out of that. Watch blindfolded. Okay, honey. We're on. And don't forget to keep her occupied while I look for that watch. Irene. Mr. Hollister. Darling, I'll bet you thought we'd never get back. <laughs> we sure missed you folks. I'll say. Say, where's Wilbur, the old son of a gun? Wait till he sees what I've got for him. Why, where's the check? <laughs> oh, and what a check. First return, $64,000. Why, didn't Wilbur get my wire? Wire? Why, why, no. Can you beat that? Well, half of this is Wilbur's. Uh, uh, what? <laughs> Darling, what's the matter? Wilbur's in the hospital. Why? He shot himself. Oh, no. Oh, yes. you poor dear. He thought, he thought you'd swindled him. Swindled He yes. thought that? Yes. Oh, but that's terrible. Because he didn't hear from us? Oh, then it's all our fault. Oh, my dear. Oh, no. Please don't feel that way. Oh. Why, where did Mr. Hollister go? Uh, uh, Mrs. King, don't go in there. Why, Mr. Hollister? I thought I told you to keep Why, her. Why, you upset with all the noise you were making. All right, can the chatter and let's blow. Fast. You got the watch? Yeah, 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 come on. Then, then you are thieves. Oh, shut up. What do we do with the old lady, Chuck? We can't leave her loose now. Uh, in the closet. Yep. Come on, Grandma. In you go. No, please. No, yeah. no. Don't peep out of you. You'll get this gun across your head. Get in there now. <laughs> Sure, she'll be all right, Chuck. Stop worrying about her. Somebody will find her. Get in the car. It's all right, Mrs. King. You're safe now. They were just here. They took the watch. We know all about it, Mrs. Kern. We've been staked out here for several days. I saw every move they made through the window just now. You were in no danger. You were outside? Then why didn't you stop them? We let them go on purpose. Lieutenant Scott is trailing them right now, right to wherever they've hidden your money. I hope. <laughs> That's us, Chuck. Yeah, hurry. Not until we get that little package. <laughs> Got the locker key? What a question. <laughs> Let's see. Number 587. 56. Ah, huh? Oh, Chuck, hurry. Will you? Relax, beautiful. Relax. Plenty of time. That's right, huh? Hey, what? Plenty of time. About ten years apiece, I'd say. Oh. Why, you, don't <laughs> you? You want it this way. Oh, Chuck! Uh. All right. Get up. Yeah. Hold out those hands. Yeah. And I'll just take that package out of the locker if you I don't look, mind. Look, you've got nothing on us. I want an attorney. I know my rights. Oh, brother. If only one of you would think up a different line. Just once. <laughs> you have the case of the bookworm. It was taken from the files of Bunko Squad through the courtesy of St. Louis Chief of Police, Jeremiah O'Connell. And now we have a message for you from Chief O'Connell himself. Thank you, Captain Crumble, for the opportunity to expose one of the most vicious swindles ever attempted in St. Louis. Thanks to Bunko Squad, nearly all of Mr. and Mrs. King's money was recovered. And I might add, Mr. King recovered, too. The Hollisters were convicted of grand theft Bunko burglary, and assault with a deadly weapon. Both are now serving a two- to 14-year sentence in the penitentiary at Jefferson City. Thank you, Chief O'Connell. It has recently come to my attention that the bookworm bunco is again being tried, this time in Cleveland, Minneapolis, and Oklahoma City. We trust that tonight's dramatic presentation of this case will serve to warn the citizens of those communities. Next week, we open the files of the police force in Albuquerque, New Mexico, for another unusual and dangerous bunco game. Be sure to join us then for the story of the vanishing freight cars. 
Until then, this is Captain Trumbull saying good night and leaving you with this warning. The bunco artist is clever. The bunco artist is vicious. The bunco artist is dangerous. So, be on your guard. The elements of tonight's case were true. Only the names were changed for the protection of innocent persons. Chief O'Donnell was represented in proxy by his permission. Next week, Captain Trumbull again opens the files of Bunko Squad for another authentic case drawn from the police records of the nation. Join us then, won't you? And meantime, be on your guard. Bunko Squad, produced and directed by Ralph Rose, is written by Larry Goldman and Troy Leonard. Original music was composed and conducted by Del Castillo. Joe Walters speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting...